It's great to see the kind of music that is being written by some young people across this country designed to effectively touch young people. And I'm sure that some of you in the first three minutes of the service today wondered what you'd fallen into. You're going to be more surprised people in heaven than you can shake a stick at because it's going to be exciting. It's going to be alive and uh, we're going to find it to be a marvelous, marvelous spot. In Galatians chapter 6, there's a verse that says, As for me, God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus. God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is the one that penned those words. He was the kind of a guy that had a lot to boast about. He was born into the right family. He had the right education. He had the right experience. He was classic in his field. And then he met Jesus Christ face to face. A day when he fell to the ground on the way to Damascus to persecute the Christians was a unique and wonderful day in his life. And not only was he born again on that day, but he grew up in his faith. He got some private time in studying the word. And in his private time of studying the word of God in the Old Testament scriptures and being instructed by God of the things that he was to go and to teach others, he became this monumental human being that we look at and so often we think, I wonder why God touched his life so. If you'll go with me to Philippians chapter 3, I think you'll see why. Your assignment for this week is to read Philippians chapter 3 every day. And as you read that and pay attention to what it has to say, I think that there's a strong possibility you will acknowledge that there might be some need for some shaping up in your own life. For he starts in verse 7 and lays out four things that he has done. Remember, we are saved by the grace of God. It is mercy and grace unlimited that flows out on us. However, as we pay attention to his mercy and his grace, we should understand that there is responsibility on us to do some things that need to be done if we're ever to experience the very best there is in walking with God. Philippians 3 and verse 7, all these things, he's just listed, all of his accomplishments, all of his academic deals, all of where he studied, all of what he had, had accomplished, he listed all there. Then he says, all these things I once thought very worthwhile, now I've thrown them away. Interesting. He didn't pray and say, oh God, take these away. He sacked them up and threw them away. Our job is to pay attention to the things we know we need to do and for the right reason we sack up all of this stuff that we hang on to because it impresses people. We can tell them how far we've come in the academic world, how we've gotten all of these wonderful degrees and hope that impresses them. Or we can tell them, we only went to the eighth grade, man, I built this business by myself from scratch, and buddy, it stretches from here to Tallahassee. All that stuff we hang on to, whether it's a lot or a little of whatever, it's the stuff that hangs on, that gives us a place for the pride of life to overwhelm us. Paul said, I've sacked it all up and I've thrown it all away. Why? So that I can put my trust and my hope in Christ alone. <clears throat> Faith, trust, hope in Christ alone. He says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Oh, ho, here's a key word. Most of the people in this building know Jesus Christ as Savior. He's talking about another issue. He's talking about knowing, knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. That means he's in charge. You salute and do what he says. 
Not a lot of back talk, not a lot of inquiry, not a lot of, how do you think you ought to ask me to do that? None of that stuff. It's saluting and going and saying, yes, I will obey. You are the Lord of my life. I will not take issue with you. I will follow you in every command you give me. And Paul said, that's why I sacked that stuff up and threw it out. That stuff's worthless when I compare it with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Question, as a believer, is Jesus Christ your Lord? Some say you can't have one without the other. I don't believe that's true. I believe the scripture is true when it says, if you'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. But I also believe that step into a place of putting him in the lordship position is a conscious decision we make. It's supposed to be a package deal when it comes to us. Savior and Lord. But with most believers, that is not true. And a simple look at the church today will tell you it's not true. Because the church is shot through and through with people that are primarily Sunday Christians. I give an assignment. Most don't do it. Russ lays these words out and the, and the scriptures to go in and says read those. Most won't do it. I know all those things are true, but I know that I continually hope for more and more people to get in the wagon and say, this is something I need. Part of the reason why I continue not to grow is that I don't spend any time in the Word. Secondly, he says, I have put all else aside. Him again. First of all, he sacked this stuff up and threw it away. Then he says, I have put all else aside. I've done this. I didn't ask God to do it. I did it. I put all else aside, counting it worth less than nothing. Why? In order that I can have Christ and become one with him. No longer counting on being saved by being good enough or by obeying God's laws, but by trusting Christ to save me for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith, counting on Christ alone. Now let me ask this of those of you that have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you have the courage this morning to say, I have never asked Jesus Christ to become my Savior. I've consistently thought I can do good enough. I'll, I'll make it on my own. I can't bring myself to bow my knee to Jesus Christ. No, I've never done that. Do you have the courage to just acknowledge that that's true between you and God Almighty to say, I've never invited Christ into my life? Thirdly, he says, now I've given up everything else. He sacks up the bunch and throws it out. He sets the other stuff aside. Now he says, now I've given up everything else. I found it to be the only way to really know Christ and to experience the mighty power that he brought back when he came back to life again from the dead and to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. I suppose I think of this verse every time I do a funeral. I was standing at a graveside Friday afternoon. I stood there with my hand in that little cemetery in Chowchilla, my hand on that casket. I thought about Dead is dead. Never had anybody rise up in the middle of one of my funeral sermons, rise up out of the box and say, hey, knock it off. Never had any response from that person ever. There have been places where I've preached where I thought I was in the middle of a cemetery because there was no response from those people either. <laughs> That's not here, by the way. But you think about him saying this, I've given up everything else. I'm not hung up on the future. I'm not hung up on more success. I have done this. I found giving up everything else to be the only way that I can really know Christ. And I can really experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again. And to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. Not many people get in that line saying, I want to suffer and die with Christ. It's a short line. The line is short enough for those who say, I really want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again. See, there's a reason why the church is weak and powerless. There's a reason why the statistics go up. There are more and more people saying, yes, they are born again. 
but there's less and less impact on the community. It's because there's so many people who are believers that do not get into the lordship business of saying, I want to know and experience the mighty power. Now, while I'm here, while I'm living, I want to experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again. I want that to flow through me as I'm walking down the path of life. Fourthly, he says, so whatever it takes, I will be one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. I like the way he says that because he doesn't say I will be the one. He said, I'm going to get in that group. I'll be one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. Where is that? That's now. That's in the here and now. When we try to reserve all of this business of what God has for us for later. If you're into music at all, you know you get into old Southern stomp style gospel songs. A lot of that come out of the black culture and a lot of the singing and music they did talked about heaven. Why? Because life was hell for them. They lived in slavery and the only opportunity they had was once a week to go down to the church house and they could let it all hang out and they could take time praising God for the fact that one day this was going to be over and they were going to finally get to heaven where they had a master that loved them, not one that beat them and overworked them and did all kinds of things. They looked forward to that and we've allowed that to carry over to those of us who live on flowery beds of ease. Where we talk about what's going to happen when we get to heaven rather than to say, I'm here and I want to know this power. I want to know this fresh newness of life right now in those that are alive from the dead. Folks, understand something. When you put your hand in the hand of the nail scarred Savior and said, I will acknowledge Jesus Christ as my Savior, that moment new life began for you for eternity and nothing can cut it off. But we ought to be experiencing something far greater in the newness of life as we're walking with God in this world that has so much need surrounding us. We ought to be the ministers of God that he intended us to be if we're overflowing with his goodness and his grace and his power working through us. Think of the guy that wrote this. Think of where he was when he wrote it. He was in jail for preaching. He said, I don't mean to say I love this disclaimer. It's important. I don't mean to say I'm perfect. I haven't learned all I should even yet. But I keep working. I keep working. You hear that? I keep working. Enough of this pathetic, well, God, just make me what you want me to be. God says, get to work on it. I've been working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. He's got an agenda. You bet he has. But our problem is we get into ourselves and we refuse to acknowledge that there is a responsibility in regard to this book. There's a responsibility in regard to the community in which we live. There's a responsibility to love and care for others. Not just our little family circle. But to find ourselves openly doing the work and the will of God. Now I ask you, how are you doing in that? It's a great disclaimer that starts, but it's pretty powerful before it ends up, that I'm going to keep on working Toward that day will now finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. Now listen to his conclusion. No, dear brothers and sisters, I'm still not all I should be. But I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing. Forgetting the past. Do you hear that, believer? Forgetting the past has been put under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgetting the past. Don't live with the notion that you've done something so awful and so terrible that you live so guilt-ridden that you're useless in the plan and the program of God Almighty and of Jesus Christ, your Savior. Forgetting the past. And looking forward to what lies ahead. 
Oh, he's already said he's laid all that down. What lies ahead? He's laid it down. I've given up everything else. I'm not living on these huge dreams. I'm not thinking some big corporate empire. I've laid that all in the Lord's lap. I'm going to forget the past and look forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven. Why? Because of what Christ Jesus did for us. I challenge you. Read Philippians chapter 3 every day this week. See what God says to you about you. If you have to face the fact that you're not yet born again because you've never trusted him as Savior, then maybe you ought to pull a card out of that rack and take it home with you just in case. So you can mail it back and say, I need to talk to somebody. If you're a believer that is living way, way, way under the circumstances, the circumstances are piled all over you and you are useless and you see yourself as less than useless in the cause of Christ, then I say to you, take heart what Paul has to say. Know that same gospel applies to you that applied to him. I believe God has incredible ministry for us both in this place, on this corner, and in this city. I believe we're about to step into the most productive year of our history. My desire is that you be a part of that and you not miss it. It's going to be a great ride. Come along. Father, accept our thanks today for the clear instruction of your word. Give us courage to assess who we are think about where we've come from and then forget the past. To think about the, the mistakes and the sin and the difficulty and the problem that we've been into. To recognize that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that too went under the blood. You came to set us free. Whether that's a person here who's never put his faith in Christ as Savior, someone who's put his faith in Christ as Savior and has never found the Lordship of, the, of God himself to be that important. Father, I pray that your spirit would move mightily on us this week. You'd bring to pass the kind of changes that need to take place to the glory of God, I pray in Jesus' name.